We've seen how prices emerge in competitive output and input markets, and how those prices cause the two sides of the market to engage in the kind of cooperation that leads to the highest possible social surplus when there are no externalities. When there are externalities, we've seen that you can use government policy to realign the incentives in the market and thereby recover that maximum social surplus. Now it turns out that one of the most powerful ways to think about the incentives for cooperation is through the use of game theory. In game theory, we take the incentives that people face in the real world and model them in the context of games. And then we think about how the players use those incentives to think about their behavior in the games and what kind of an equilibrium emerges. Suppose, for example, we think about two people who could specialize in whatever area they have a comparative advantage and then trade with one another. That's a form of cooperation. Or they could choose to not specialize and trade less. That would be a form of non-cooperation. We could model that in a simple, what we call, game matrix. In a game matrix, we put one player on the vertical axis, let's call that player one, and the other player on the horizontal axis, let's call that player two. Then we put on the axes what actions the two players have available to them. So in our context, player one can choose to cooperate, specialize and trade, or not cooperate, not specialize and trade less. Player two has the same possible options, cooperate or not cooperate. Then we can fill in the matrix with what we call the payoffs to the players. How much surplus do they get under the different ways in which the game could be played? If they both cooperate, then perhaps they'll get a surplus of 100 each. So the first number will be the surplus for player one, and the second number will be the surplus for player two when they both cooperate. What if player one cooperates and player two does not cooperate? Well, in that case, player one gets some of the benefits from cooperation. He is trading and he's specializing. Player two doesn't get as many benefits. He's not specializing and not trading as much. So perhaps player one gets a payoff of 75 and player two gets a payoff of only 50. If the reverse holds, player two cooperates and player one does not cooperate, then those payoffs will be reversed. Now player two will get the higher payoff, she's cooperating, but player one's getting the lower payoff from not cooperating. And then if they, neither one of them cooperates, if they're just an island onto themselves, perhaps they'll get a payoff of 30 each. Now we can look at this game matrix and think through the incentives that the two players face. Think about being player one. Suppose you think that player two is going to cooperate. Well, in that case, you're gonna find yourself in this column. You have a choice between cooperating and getting 100 or not cooperating and getting 50. 100's better than 50, so you would choose to cooperate. Suppose, on the other hand, that you think that player two is not going to cooperate. Then you're gonna find yourself in that second column you have a choice between 75 from cooperating and 30 from not cooperating. 75 is better, so again, you should cooperate. In other words, regardless of what the other player is doing, it is in your in best interest to cooperate. That's what we call a dominant strategy in game theory. So a dominant strategy is a strategy that is best for a player regardless what the other player does. So in this case, player one has a dominant strategy to cooperate because regardless of what player two does, it's in his best interest to cooperate. 
And of course, the same holds for player two. If player two thinks player one's going to cooperate, then she's going to find herself in this row. In this row, she has a choice between 100 and 50. 100 is better than 50, so cooperating would be best for her if she thinks the other player is going to cooperate. What if she thinks player one's not going to cooperate? Then she's going to find herself in this lower row with a choice between 75 and 30. 75 is better. So, not, so cooperating is once again her best choice. So regardless of what she thinks player one's going to do, it's best for her to cooperate. So in this game, cooperation is a dominant strategy for both players. And as a result, cooperation is going to emerge in equilibrium. We're going to end up in this box within the matrix because both players are going to cooperate. These are the typical incentives that we would think of as market incentives in the absence of externalities. Cooperation emerges, and that cooperation leads to the highest possible social surplus. Social surplus here is 200, whereas it's only 125 here and here, and only 60 here. But not all games are going to have those incentives. Think of a different game. Think of the case where two players face a common resource, a lake with fish in it or something like that. And they can choose to conserve and not overfish the lake. And that way, there'll be lots of fish available for them in the future. Or they can choose to not conserve, to overfish, and the fish will be depleted over time. So again, we'll have player one, and we'll have player two. They have two choices. They can conserve or not conserve. So conserving would be cooperating, cooperating with one another to keep the lake healthy. Not conserving would be just taking what you can and not thinking about whether you're overfishing or not. So if you're conserving, suppose that your payoff will be 75 if the other player also conserves. But if you choose to conserve and the other player does not conserve, you are bearing all the cost of conserving, and the other player is benefiting from your conservation, but just taking whatever she can. So suppose in that case, the outcome would be that the person who conserves, player one, gets a payoff of 40, and the person who doesn't conserve gets a payoff of 80. The reverse would be true if player two conserves and player one does not conserve. So in this case, player two would get 40, and player one would get 80. And then let's suppose that if neither one of them conserves, then neither one of them bears the cost of conserving, and they just grab what they can, but the fish will get depleted over time, so they'll both get a payoff of, say, 50. We can then analyze the incentives in this game exactly the same way as we did over here. Suppose you're player one, and you think that player two is going to conserve. If player two is going to conserve, you're going to find yourself in this column. You can get a payoff of 80 by not conserving, or 75 by conserving. 80 is better for you, so you'll choose not to conserve. What if you think the other player is not going to conserve? Well, now you're going to be in the second column, choosing between 40 and 50. 50 is higher, therefore not conserving gets you a higher payoff. So again, you're not going to conserve if you think the other player is not going to conserve. In other words, not conserving is a dominant strategy. No matter what you think the other player is going to do, your best response is not to conserve. You'll get the higher payoff. And of course, the same incentives hold for player two. If she thinks player one is going to conserve, she'll be in the top row. 
choosing between 75 and 80, 80 is better. And if she thinks player one's not going to conserve, she's going to be in the lower row choosing between 40 and 50, 50 is better. So not conserving is a dominant strategy for both players. As a result, non-cooperation emerges. Both of them are going to overfish and the lake will be depleted. That situation is often referred to as the tragedy of the commons. There's a commonly owned resource, the lake. And the tragedy of the commons is that everyone has an incentive to overuse the commons because no one is thinking about the impact they're having on everybody else. There's an externality that's present. It's the same externality as the one we get for pollution of the air. The air is commonly owned. We use the air and think about our own private benefit of using the air not the consequences to everybody else. There's a negative externality resulting in a tragedy of the commons. So whenever we have a tragedy of the commons, there's an overuse, there's an incentive to overuse the commons and get to a non-cooperative outcome. And as a result, we'll end up here, both players getting 50, when they both could have had 75 if they just found a way to cooperate. So here, we don't get social surplus being maximized. Rather, we end up with social surplus below the maximum social surplus.